And one of the common themes that's come out is the importance of you cannot rely on just yourself, the importance of partnerships and teaming. So to that end, I would like to hear from each and every one of you about how do you seek out, what do you do to identify potential teaming partners, as well as what criteria do you look for? Are you looking for different certifications, 8As? Are you looking for relationships? What exactly ha have you looked for, or maybe what you're even currently looking for when it comes to teaming opportunities? Um, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of a difficult question to answer in a way, because I think a lot of times teaming efforts sort of happen. I mean, you can... For us, for example, in trying to find a machining shop that we could um, share business with early on, we had several in our area, and we found one that's about an hour south of us that turned out that we have a pretty good mix culture-wise. And I guess maybe whatever your business culture might be or your business philosophy, if you can find someone or a group of someones that have a similar philosophy on business and or life, it certainly makes that type of work substantially easier. Um, you know, I, again, for me, I think uh, partnerships just sort of, in, in many ways, just end up happening. Um, I've been involved in Chamber of Commerce and Rotaries and, you know, blah, 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 blah. I don't mean to discount those. They serve a really good purpose. It's a good place to meet people to talk about your business and to see what they do differently or the same way that you do. And many, many times you find good relationships there to partner and to, to help you with your business. Again, just people to bounce out ideas off of. But uh, again, for me, it's many times, again, just yes. meet Carol and you know, singing next to her in church. And next thing you know, we, you know we, we have some things that we can share and work on together. So I, I think sometimes it, it just works itself out like that. Uh, as in many cases, I think the harder you try, the more difficult it may become. Um, and sometimes those relationships are literally the person sitting next to you um, in some meeting that you go to every week or every month. Um, who knows? I, I would be remiss, and I, and I just need to bring this up real quickly. I, I heard someone else mention Florida MEP. We also got ISO and AS9100 a couple of years ago. Um, uh, Phyllis Morisi was going to be here. She sent me an email just before I got here. I've never met Julie. I've seen you before. It's nice to see you. Uh, Florida MEP was spectacular. Um, they got our, our AS9100 um, and ISO registrations done for us um, with a guy named Wilhelm who was awesome. You know, what a great group of people to do business with. It costs you little or no money to, if you want to talk about a partner, mm -hmm. that's a partner that you need because they really, really do help you. They give you a tremendous amount of information, again, at little or no cost. I don't care what your business is. They will help you, and they'll help you find people to partner with. So I, I, I really, I, I should have mentioned that early on, and I, and I didn't. Um, I get rambling and I forget, I don't even know my name half the time. So, uh, but, but what a great group to do business with. So, so anytime there are, there are functions like this, and I, I've never been particularly involved in the EDC. Carol tells me I should, you know. I went there a couple times and they had really good wine. I, I don't remember a lot, a lot of other things. I remember how to get your back. No, I, I remember stealing wine from other tables with a couple other guys because it was a little boring. But. But, but I mean, but again, you know, you're going to find business groups like that that you can deal with, that you can partner with, and can help you form those alliances. So, uh, again, without our AS, uh, ISO and AS9100 registrations, we, we probably would not have survived, or we would have very, very, uh, at a much lesser level than we are now. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to add, sorry, to that, that w working for the large prime contractor, that's essential from any, for any sub-level. I mean, that kind of credentialing took you up to where you were a qualified subcontractor. Yeah, so absolutely. that'll definitely set you apart. You, you need to work to getting that kind of credentialing in place before you're even a player. 
you can be small. I, I did it with 10 employees, yeah. and half of those were part-time. Yeah. You know, and a lot of times, I think you'll see the large companies implemented it later on. It became more and more difficult, and I thought, you know, it's, it, it's costly. Mm -hmm. It is not cheap. Now, with MEP, a lot of times half of that or less, but then you've got to recertify every year, so that's a cost. But something else can give because that's what's so important. And the ITAR, we did our ITAR the registration and compliance through MEP as well. So. Um, can, can I just add a little bit? To, and I, I agree with, with Dawn here that it's, you know, really the, the, the relationships present themselves. You can't try too hard. But the one thing I go off is intuition. And that just goes along with, you know, do I feel good about this person? Is this a good relationship? You know, do we have that same kind of uh, our core values? Because we're our company's really, um, our core values are very important. But it becomes that gut feeling. And you're, you're going to get that. Yeah, you're going to go to business development meetings and you're going to present your capabilities to you know, some of these other companies. But I think the bottom line is when you meet someone and you feel okay I've got that relationship and I know like uh, Susan and Colleen back there you know we with uh, with their company it's same kind of a thing we're not competitors there's that relationship of okay this feels good and I'm, I'm okay and your business types may tell you that's not the way to do it and you should be vetting people out and you should look at the cert and certifications are good but that doesn't mean everything if you find the right company to partner with sometimes you can help them move along to those certifications you know or if they're in the middle of certification process like we were with AS9100 so you know never discount that don't be too you know business like on that go with that intuition and that'll take you i think you know along because we don't have money or time to start relationships and then have them go south you know, I think it's important. You want to keep small businesses. We got to keep those same people, those same relationships as we grow and as they grow. So, I just do it off intuition. Anybody else like to? Well, I just wanted to mention that I think some of us are in very technical businesses. Maybe all of us, except for Karen. And I think one of the prime problems we're going to see going forward is having enough employees, technical employees. Not a lot of this is the bane of my existence. Not a lot of young people are going into what technical people are doing, and I think that's a huge problem. Knowing that's coming, I think teaming and partnering with other people is huge. Helping them, helping them figure out what you don't do yourself. You can't wear all the hats. You have to start looking to other people. Now, there are some wonderful programs, and we're kind of pushing mentorships and internships again to get young people coming up but I think it's something we all have to be aware of and therefore that gets us all talking to each other and and seeing what it is we can do not that that's a negative and I do want to ask Karen after the fact what we can do because every small to medium business I speak to it's probably their number one problem is getting talent or hiring and maybe that's a case of we're trying to wear too many hats. I'm only good at maybe one and a half things, and HR isn't one of them. So I think those are all things we have to think about. But getting the teaming, waiting for somebody big to come to you, that's fine. Could be too big for you. Waiting, I mean, I speak to people every day. Can you do this for me? Can, you, can I do this for you? And again, I agree with Carol. A lot of it is just having like values and knowing that you can get along. But I wanted to put that point in about hiring because that is huge and we do depend on a lot of technical business in Brevard. We have the most manufacturers I think per capita. I read somewhere somebody else will know the statistics and those are problems that are coming down the road. Large companies are having the same problem. Exactly. I'm the chair of the industry council for EDC right. and one of the big conversations, this is GE <coughs> Melbourne, GE Aviation, this is Harris, Harris Lockheed. Right. Right. Everybody they say okay we're struggling finding the people. You know there's a component though of, of good people people knowing they're good people with the technical background and being willing to invest in the training that's the thing that I think as small businesses and large businesses, you have to decide do you want to make that investment in an, an individual who is very skilled very intelligent but maybe skilled in a different area and in, make that investment and then bring them into so because it's going to cost money but that's your decision as an employer I think if you make that decision it's the smartest thing you can do it's that little bit of investment that takes you next level so Huh. And workplace culture could be part of that too. <laughs> so um, I'll just add a couple of things. It's really just um, reinforcing some of the things that have already been mentioned. For our company, relationships are really key because we are small. So um, we reach out to generally the first uh, you know, folks that we reach out to or companies are are people um, that we know and they know our you know our business and our folks our work ethic um, they know they're going to get quality results and the, there's going to be an impact on the bottom line a positive impact on the bottom line so we really re leverage the relationships because we are small and because we you know 
we didn't grow up in Brevard. I, I wasn't here, as you heard my story. Um, so it's really, really important for us to leverage um, those folks that we know. And um, the gut instinct, definitely. Mm-hmm. And the values thing, definitely. Can't say that enough, stress that enough. You really, it's just a matter of like, do you click with people? Do they get you? Do you, you know, you're like, okay, so you know, you're tracking with them. And, you know, you're a team. In other words, I spoke of, you know, like a, a board of advisors, if you will. And that's really what it's about, especially for a small company. Company, um, like us now we reach out to um, similar um, we reach out to other companies that are in similar industry we do and you hear me say network outside of that be comfortable outside of that but we do because a lot of times that's where our sub work comes from because they need help <laughs> and so they've picked up a contract they've got to be in you know Indiana California and all over the place and guess what they need help so we help you know basically supplement you know, their efforts. Um, so that's a great uh, way to sub um, with like-minded um, companies that are, are similar industries. We also look for other industry. We just had um, talks with a, uh, an organization that does um, accounting and, and government auditing. Um, and they were looking at partnering um, and teaming up actually on a contract um, that there's a management consulting piece. They can't do that part. They can do the auditing piece though. So they'll do the auditing piece and our company is looking at providing, you know, teaming with them and providing the management piece because they cannot mix the two. Great, they're not in any line of business of what we do, but it just works out that way. So we kind of are looking for, you know, anything's fair game. You know, <laughs> it's open. Um, we do start with, like I said, the relationships though, the people that came out of a relationship type thing. I knew two of the ladies that worked in that organization and they said, hey, Karen, I know that you and your company and the folks that you've got on board can do these kinds of things. And um, talking about subbing, we actually do that ourselves. The majority of our folks, that's what they are. They sub to our company because work ebb and flow. So it depends on the contract, depends on the type of work that we have. And so so we, as a company, actually sub most of our folks. Um, we just have a couple, uh, same, I'm where you were in 2004, I guess, <laughs> with a few part-time employees, and they pull a heck of a lot of weight. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of uh, what we, when we look at, you know, how do we reach out and find that work? We look at relationships first. Secondly, we do try to leverage, you know, we are veteran-owned and we are a woman-owned, um, economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business. Um, and so we do leverage that too, because a lot of times that can be a little bit of leverage with um, teaming agreements um, for larger companies. So we're just starting to get pretty aggressive on that and kind of putting it out there. Um, but relationships definitely were first. So. Okay. Well, you know, one of the other themes that's kind of come out through all of your answers, all of your responses and your experience, definitely the resilience that you've, you continue to demonstrate, the passion, the relationships. But is there ever that time when you say no? So is there a point when you have to say no at some point in time? And if so, when does that happen? When do you have to say no in a certain situation? <laughs> Sorry, Karen. Um, Kathy, you want to answer? No, She's used up her time. <laughs> Pinch. I know uh, no, I never say no. <laughs> I have a hard time actually saying no. I probably take on too many projects, too many clients, too many things going on because I feel like I could help somebody. Mm-hmm. I guess the only time I would personally say no is if I feel I'm, I don't have the capability of doing it and I wouldn't be doing somebody, you know, um, justice by not giving them my 100%. I mean, you know, I know my limitations. Like, um, for instance, I'm not a tax attorney. I'm not giving anybody any tax advice. And the w- one piece of advice I give them is go see your CPA. That's what I tell them if you want to see anything. But, you know, I mean, if, if somebody has an expectation that you know or can do something and you know you can't, to me it would be a terrible, terrible recipe for disaster by trying to do something that I can't do. Um, I'm not saying you can't go learn stuff, so don't take it that way. Is you know, I'm all for process improvement, and you know, even the the um, the training that Julie offers for lots of companies. I mean, that she's even said, you know, I mean, I can go on and take on training myself if I wanted to, and continue to improve from there. There may be um, some additional legal uh, areas that I'd like to uh, hone my skills in. 
Um, but really, that's the only way I say no. Other than that, I think there's pretty much a solution to everybody's issue one way or the other. And, and again, maybe that's more of my litigation background because it's bringing people together to resolve issues. And really, I, I put a lot of the uh, personality issues aside and let's just bring people together and see how we can get it resolved. And, you know, that works across the board and relationships. But Karen has a, a no story. <laughs> I was actually, it's very similar. <laughs> <laughs> I do actually have a no story. Um, I think probably all the panel members will agree that, you know, we love a challenge, bring it on. It's hard to say no. And I think even Carol, I mentioned that, you know, like, okay, well, it just diversifies our business. Um, and we have an answer, and that's why we do the things we do, because you know, we lean way forward, and that's why we are where we are. Um, so it's hard to say no. Um, I will say, though, that the similar, you know, there have been times that this just came up, actually, with our company. We were asked to, um, you know, if we'd be interested in teaming on something, um, and uh, we basically, when we got down into it, I was like, well, eh, it's a little, hand, I don't know, gut instinct, whatever it was, I was a little hesitant to say, oh, yeah, sure. Well, tell me a little bit more because I got a couple of questions about that. I wasn't real clear. And as we started digging into it, it was a matter of like, you know, I don't want to put myself out there. I don't want to let you down. You know, I don't want to obviously, you know, any stink on our company either for not being able to follow through because we, we just maybe didn't have that background or that experience that you needed. And so we kind of, eh, we could help on certain things, but teaming is probably not the way to go. So that would be one. And the other, and this is more of a personal thing, um, I'm in HR. I get the whole work-life balance thing. I can tell you all about it, but I don't personally do that so well myself. <laughs> so there have been a couple instances, though, when um, opportunities have arisen, and one was coincidentally during my son's um, birthday. This was last year, and it was an awesome opportunity. Great job. I was in a location that I had never been that I wanted to go. Um, it was very hard to say no. At first, I was kind of like, well, maybe I'll go ask him if he minds if I miss his birthday. Um, <laughs> needless to say, that wouldn't go over so well. So I passed up on that opportunity. And then that just happened again recently in March where we had another opportunity. But it was spring break, and our family takes spring break um, as a family, and we go off for the week. And so it was another one of those, well, you know, I, you just got to say no. I may not be good on a daily basis, but... Um, I do try to draw the line and uh, have time for my family. And so, because you can become consumed, you will become consumed if you allow it. I mean, it's just inevitable. In the line of work that we do, you work all day, night, never sleep, and you still won't get it all done. It's just not gonna happen. Part of the reason why we have other folks, um, but part of the reason for drawing the line, not healthy. Um, so, um, so yeah, there have been times where we've said no, and it's really been more for personal reasons, so. I never say no. I mean, honestly, I, you know, I could say I say no, but there's too many people who know me in here that know I don't say no. Because I figure if I can't do it, I can find somebody who can. Whether it's my employees, it's my team, you know, whoever it is, they can do it. And that goes for even some of, you know, we're, we're support, we support the community quite a bit. And we are involved in a lot of things. And it's great because I have others who will go to certain events or support organizations and do it. Does, even though I joke and I say it's all about me, it's really not all about me, and I've got, I've got that luxury now, especially as we've grown. But even in the beginning, it was that same mentality. I was a one-woman show, but I'm like, if somebody asked me if we could do a particular thing, I knew I could find somebody. You know, services, products, whatever it is. Yeah, I could do it because the one thing I do well is um, I, I get people, I think, if I have to say that. I think I do that well just based on I can look back now and see the core group that we have internally. Um, so, again, I, I don't say no. Work-life balance? Absolutely, mm -hmm. and, and I do struggle. I have a child with a disability, and so I've got a lot of doctor's appointments, and you know, my husband's in the military still, and plus he flies for airlines, so there's a lot of things that it gets difficult, but, but again, I can say yes, and then find somebody else to kind of represent or support, so that, that's the way that I handle that never say no kind of an attitude. Don, Don. come on, man. Come on, You're, Don. You, know, you never say no. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I told a customer on the phone the other day, they were trying to get some parts out the door very quickly for us for about the 37th time, you know, hold on. I, I told him, <laughs> yeah. I told her, I said, look, I'll be honest with you, you know, when it comes to money, I'm a whore, okay? I mean, I want my money as fast as anybody, I want it now. But because you call me and email me every day, I'm not gonna work any faster, okay? Leave me alone and let me do my job. So that being said, I want business 
badly. I want money coming through. And when I get a chance to do business with a large prime contractor in our area, I jumped into that with both feet. Three times I jumped into that with both feet. The last time I said, thank you very much. Because I found out that their culture and our culture just didn't mix. And it's a, it's a, if I told you the name, you'd know, it's a large, large prime contractor in the area. But for us, they're a very, very difficult group to do business with. Actually, I think for a lot of people in our area, they're a difficult group to do business with. But, but that's beside the point. But you know, when, as a small business, and you're struggling, I mean, I took money out of my IRA to make payroll one week, okay? You know, my wife and I put our house on the line more than once to make sure we had enough business, enough money to run our business and that our employees got paid. I went without a paycheck for six months trying to keep things. I've done a lot of things that have been creative to make sure we had money. So when somebody offers you money to do business with them, it's like, yeah, here we go, we got it. But when it's the wrong culture and it's not a good fit, thank you very much, but no. And we've tried with this particular company on several occasions and, and I just, I don't even take, I, I seldom take their phone calls because it's just not worth, it's not worth the aggravation. My time is important. My employees' time is very important. And we want to be productive and move forward. So yes, you do say no. And, and I think sometimes you have to say it politely. Sometimes you have to be rather stern about no. Um, and it depends on situation and, and the customer. So again, you know, we're all small business owners. And we all want money, and we all ask, that's why we're here. You know, we have a passion for running a business or whatever it is you do. We all have a passion there, but we have to make money at it. It's not, we're not all charitable organizations. So you just have to, and again, you know, it's in here. You know, you, you have to, you're going to feel it. If it feels right, you go forward. If it doesn't, your guts are going to, your guts are going to tell you, I think 90% of the time whether you're right or wrong. And it goes back to the relationship. It absolutely Hopefully you don't does. have to say no if you don't have, if you've got the relationship with the right people that are coming yeah. to you. Yeah, absolutely. Back to the relationships. No, you're okay. I think one, one point is the two old folks back here on this side are going to tell you maybe a little differently, and that is when I started out, and this is my fourth business, when I started out, I said no to absolutely nothing. I said yes to everything. Because to Carol's point, I could hire somebody to do it. And I didn't know anything. My first company was an engineering company. It doesn't give you a lot of confidence. But I didn't know anything. So I said yes and then hired towards it. As I've gotten older, to Don's point, I have fired so many customers. And I'm actually proud of that, that you get to a point where you can fire customers. Because that's your peace of mind. And when we were talking about success, for me, at this old age, success is how I use my time. And I refuse to use my time on useless ad adventures, at useless business. So telling a customer, and quite often, it's worked the opposite. When I've told a large prime, I don't want to work with you, they will hound me, and I will get so much work out of them, but now it's on my terms, or I will walk away. And I think that's an important part of, as you mature in a business, you go, Hell no, I don't want to do that. And they don't understand why. But again, I think to the point of success is how you use your time. I mean, my grandchildren and my children are more important to me than any dollars coming through the door from a prime contact, prime contractor. And I think we have to put that into perspective. But the young I'm folk, agree. they're still saying yes. <laughs> well, you know, and I, I think she's, she's not that young. I'm not that young, exactly. I, agree. I think there's We're all blind. But I think the difference here is what you're saying no or what you're saying yes to. I mean, again, I haven't really been presented with too many situations where I've said no to a customer because I've had issues with them. I mean, I'm sure we've said no somewhere along the way, but, you know, so it's all really going to depend on, on your situation. It feels good to tell a customer, yeah. doesn't it? No. <sighs> See, and I, I, yeah, we've never had, really had that experience. Now, with the well, larger companies... I'll take companies, that in mind when I ask you to Yeah, do I won't say no. <laughs> But, you know, but I wouldn't, no, but I wouldn't say no because I got the relationship with you. Exactly. And some of the larger companies, I want to say something about the larger companies. I, I agree with Don and, and with a lot but of what he's saying that. with some of the companies. But the thing is, those large companies are made up of people. Right. And they're made up of people from different divisions. So what you're doing is you're actually looking for the individuals that align with you personally that are in that. Sometimes you don't have that luxury. And I've seen that. I've got a services side, engineering, and then I've also got the, you know, products and machining. So, 
you know, you, you, it's not just the big company. Yeah, there's a lot of bureaucracy that, you know, it does bubble up to the top and there's some things you can't get around. But if you still look for those relationships, don't always shy away. But, you know, I think that's something to, to, uh, to think about. Um, and it's true. I mean, if somebody, one thing is if someone treats myself or my employ, employees poorly, ooh, watch out. I am not a nice person. And so I'm sure there have been cases where I've, you know, backed off from people because of that. And you're the same way. You know, go down fighting for anybody. You betcha. Well, I think to the point of the big prime contractors, we have to get to a point where we realize they need us as much or more at times than we need them and use that to your advantage. I have one of the large primes coming to me that says we can't get the funding. A small business can. So would you do this? And then you sort of sit back and go, well, under these conditions, maybe. But I think you remember that, that they do need us as much as we used to think we needed them. But certainly I agree. There's some fabulous, uh, most of what I know in my business I've learned from the prime contractors and they will manage contracts that I could never hope to even if I teamed with everyone in this room. <coughs> so I think to your end, Carol, it's who you're dealing with and what position you're in. And it's easy for us to say now, especially me, hey, you know, be, be picky about who you want in there and the, and the documentation. But I remember being the one-man show, and I'm like, you know what, I don't care. I don't care if that teaming agreement says firstborn. It's really not like that. But still, I don't care if the teaming agreement doesn't have everything I want in it. I've got to get past performance. i got to get in there. And so I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to figure out how to work it later. Eventually, though, your, your goal should be to get past that where you can say, nope, I need this in that agreement. I still fight with uh, some of these larger companies where they're saying, nope, I'm indemnification, nope. Yeah, you know, always. but there's a point where I got to go, but there's a point where you have to say, okay, is it worth the risk? You know what? It's worth the risk saying, I'm going to give you what you want in your contract because it's going to be this on the, on the other end. And so you, can't, you don't always have the luxury. You know, that, you know, we sit here and say we have that luxury. You guys aren't, you don't necessarily have that, or you may not if you're a small company. So you just got to decide what you're willing to accept and what you're not. When I, and I'll tell you from the prime perspective when I had that was um, they're pretty inflexible when it comes to negotiating any of those terms. You know, it's uh, their way or the highway. And even as a large sub to another large contractor, Prime Lockheed, forget it. I mean, even, you know, USA was partially owned by Lockheed. You think we could have gotten a little, a little break on negotiating the terms? No way. I mean, they were, they were just not flexible. So pick your battles. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If you can agree to the indemnification clause because it's in there, you don't like it, nobody likes it, it's extra risk, take it. You know what I mean? Move forward. I think another point that um, I also heard is building those relationships. A lot of people ask, well, how do you get in with the primes? And I mean, you can go and you can knock on every large prime, small business liaison person. They're just the door. You need to get into the organization and you need to become best friends with the people in the program that are directing you know, that work. Because that's the person that then goes to procurement and says, "Hey, I like Kathy and her company. Can't you, you know, can't you work with them? They're they're the ones that, you know, they can do it. They can do the work. That's how you get into it. And I mean, I think really understanding some of those fundamentals is how to get in there. And literally, it's building those relationships. Um, Carol mentioned my my friend Susan back there. And what does she do? She goes in and she reassures her customers as often as she can. They're in the huge, big prime organizations that she's there. Her company's going to give them what they need on time. Their word is golden, that sort of stuff. And that's what the people need to hear. That pushes down into procurement. Procurement lets the order and you're in. But if you don't, if you don't have those relationships somewhere in that program there, the work itself, you're not gonna. You're not gonna get any work. I don't care how many boxes you check off. You know, um, it, it's it doesn't it doesn't work that way. So you kind of have to do a lot of things at one time. But the key to getting the work is to build those relationships, and they can come from the craziest spots. I mean, it may not. It, yeah. Well, they just remember Susan because of her hair, personally. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then usually the men, you know, the, the room full of men, Susan does. She shines. <laughs> That's why this community is so important. I mean, I've yeah. seen it since I moved here in 2004, and I, it's the two degrees of separation. In yeah. So it's the, it's the negative and the positive that goes along. It's like being in high school, 750,000 or how many people are in here. But, um, but that's why it's so important, because you don't realize. Now, you shouldn't be seeking out people 
to be friends with because you know they're in a certain organization, but you'd be surprised the people that you're around and you become friends with, whether it's a soccer team or surfing or it's going to EDC, whatever it is, um, that you know you, you find that those people are in those organizations that you want to do business with. And that then you got to be careful about, because I know we all feel the same way, if I have a friend or someone who's going to recommend me or I'm you know working in an organization, I am not going to let them down. I mean, I don't mm-hmm. care what it takes. And yeah. I've said that to some of the employees who work for me. And I, when I find out we're doing business, somebody said, do not let them down. Yeah. You do, I will come down. I will hunt you down. You know, because it's that important. I can't. It's the same thing. We were going. We were, were working with you guys. I'm like, oh, you know, if we give him any business or advice. You know, he's a good friend. You know, and they all agree. But I think that's important. So maybe that's a good thing. It makes us work that much harder because we don't want to let other people down. So. Well, I have our closing question for this portion of the of the session before we transition to Q and A. And I actually want to kind of explore more about your successes. So if you can share your most recent success, whether it's large or small, and what did it take to obtain that success, whether it's business, personal, mixture of both. Um, Love I would say my most recent or my ongoing success is opening this office over in the Middle East, not politically maybe the best idea, but it happened to be Lockheed Martin again and the Air Force that said we have no one who wants to support our F-15, F-16 programs, and I'll make this quick. Our Air Force sold billions and billions of dollars of used airplanes to Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, etc. When the Air Force does that, they have to support an MRO or maintenance plan for the next 25 years. So here they are scrambling to get U.S. material, U.S. products. So someone came to me, someone, some uh, business associate came to me and said, would you be interested in this? And this is the old, I mean, look how old, I th- why the heck not? I'll try it, it'll make my company more valuable when I go to sell it or whatever I do in the future. So this became an ongoing situation talking to them. Well, it just so happened, and let me give kudos to both the EDC here in Brevard, because I was here at the time, and Enterprise Florida. They saw to send me to the Paris Air Show. I didn't know that much, but God bless them. Gave me a grant. I went to Farnborough Air Show, Singapore Air Show. So during these, going to these shows, you meet a lot of people. Networking, I think we would all say, is huge. And I met an individual from the United Arab Emirates. Now, you would think straight off, it's a woman, a Muslim country, there's no way she can do this. Well, she is now an employee of mine, and she is running my office over there. And through that relationship, it'll probably conservatively take my company to five to ten times what it is now. Now, that's that side of it. I was also smart enough to say, and I'm trying to use all kinds of Florida companies to help fulfill those parts. So... Make sure you give your name or your business card to me. I know a lot of you. And also, while that was going on, I said to these people, you know what? You need skin in the game because it's not just going to be me. And Larton was very nice and said, we'll give you office space. This is the time when you say no. I said to them, no way. I don't want to be tied to you. I want to be an independent. You really want to be in an office all by yourself? Anyway, I've lived all over the world. You'll see me on a post office wall. (laughs) So I said, no, I'm going to do this on my own. Well, then I said to them, what do you have that I can distribute? Like, I don't have enough to do. And I have an opportunity coming forward to perhaps bring a huge manufacturing um, opportunity here to Brevard County. I'm choosing Brevard because that's where I know most of my... Um, manufacturing, machining people, and this is a huge, and I am trying to keep money, as I say, in Florida. So that success is this little company that was in Titusville at the air, at the airport. I have an office in Canada, and now this office. I'm just going over 1st of October to sign, hopefully, the manufacturing side. I have the distribution for Canada, United States, Mexico, and I just put in, what about South America? And I think it caught them off guard. They said, why not? So as I say, that's, that's what I'm doing. And using my teaming side of it is, I will need companies all over to, I only do materials to fill out the parts part of it. So that's one of the reasons Susan can tell you how long have we been talking about teaming, right? Susan, we just beat this in the ground. We need to do this, not just to keep each other alive, but to be able to get a bigger piece of the slice. I'm Good for you. Oh, I'm exhausted. Yes. Just thinking about it. I don't have any successes. Nothing. 
sitting between two. I'm, I'm feeling rather insignificant at this point. Um, I'll, I'll give you a success maybe on a different level. Um, as I told you, my wife and I one time worked together. Big mistake. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I own a sheet metal business. But she is also a 50% owner of our business. And believe me, there are a lot of discussions in the evenings about our business and what we're doing and her business as well um, because I have some experience there. So we talk a lot about how our business is going, what direction we're taking, what are we, where are we going next, where we've been, you know, we just a lot of things. But one of the things that's been, and this is more of a personal level, I should say, she's from North Pennsylvania, Erie, Pennsylvania. It's on the lake. Yeah, I know. It's the center of the I universe. It's the center of the universe. Years. Stop. It's, okay, it's the center of the universe. I hate it. Anyway, <laughs> so every time I mention Erie, Pennsylvania, some, oh, I was there. <laughs> See? So the mistake on the she has, she's been in Florida for almost 30 years. She still has her family up there. and She's always wanted to own a house up there. You know, so about a year and a half, almost two years ago, I guess, we finally, we bought a little house. And so we've been up there about three or four times this summer. She's still there now. And her business, she can work from her business on a remote basis. So, I mean, she's on the phone, obviously, all day long. Um, and I can to a limited extent. So from a, from a personal standpoint, from a success story, we have been able to spend more time together, run our business remotely, enjoy some time together with family and with friends, but not having the daily hammer on the head of being in an office and dealing with people. So for us, that's a huge success. And you know, we, it's something we can take advantage of over the next several years. Maybe eventually it's some sort of a retirement area for us permanently, part-time. I, I don't know. That's, that's way too far in the future. I, you ladies plan all you want. <laughs> I'm just trying to get by for today. So um, you know, I think on a personal level, that's a big thing for us. So you know, we've, we've got a second home and a, and a place to get away. Still work, but still have a great time and enjoy ourselves and our friends and family. Exactly. Very cool. That's, that's a good thing for him, but he's been gone. It means I'm singing. The, I'm the only tenor in the choir, actually. He's not missing that. But honestly, he's been gone so much. She, he's not, he's I, mean, not I, should, I should tell you. One day, she picks up a piece of music and sits down at the piano. and She never sees me. She plays a thing flawlessly. Yeah, I'm not, it's, you're just saying that you're just being nice now. You're trying to butter up. No, I'm going to tell you the bad thing. Her husband's back there. I go, John, I hate her. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I wanted to be a musician my whole life. I can barely read it, much less play or sing it. She's an extremely talented woman. So no, no, don't no, let her no, kids no. You haven't, don't Now her kids. you haven't heard him say it in a quartet. He's so, amazing. Anyway, but anyway, you so. You never heard me. I, well, yes, I have. But uh, um, I'll, I'll do the personal side as well because um, this month, I mentioned I have a son with a rare genetic disorder, and that disorder is something called prader willi syndrome. And that's a disorder that the worst case is that kids and adults never feel full. They can actually eat themselves to death. And there's a lot of side effects that go along with that. Um, you know, they're, they're supposed to be morbidly obese, overweight, short, small hands, small feet, um, mild to severely mentally retarded, those kinds of things. And we were lucky to have some early interventions. But um, but just recently, I took him to his endocrinologist, to the doctor. It was Monday, which is what, two, a couple of days ago, I guess. Um, and uh, and the doctor said, okay, I got to tell you something. And he goes, and you're probably not going to believe this or you're not going to like it. And I said, what? And he said, um, Danny needs to eat more. <laughs> and I'm like, what? I mean, this is a child who you're sitting here thinking like, okay, I've always got to control his appetite. You know, we got to be careful about what he eats, that kind of thing. Of course, he hears that and he's like, yeah. And it's like, we're going to Starbucks after this. But, uh, but I said, what do you mean? He said he's, he's doing so well that, you know, he's, he's maintained his weight so well that in order to grow as, you know, a young boy, he's 11 years old, he's, you know, he needs food to keep growing. And so, so I said, okay, all right, you know, I'll make sure to get some healthy foods. And he goes, you're not going to like this one either. I'm like, what? He said, calories are calories. He said, let that child eat what he wants. Wow. And you have That's no great. idea. I said, I'll start to cry because you have no idea what it's like to have that burden kind of lifted off of you for that. And maybe it's only going to be for a short period of time, but it's a, that was a wonderful thing. And so that was the personal success. And, and that's one of the reasons that I do what I'm doing when it comes to my company, because you know I want to make sure that my son has an independent life and that he has a future. And so with the resources, the people I meet, the company, if it's successful, I can make sure that he's got that future. So that's, that's my success story. <laughs> <Wonderful>. <laughs> 
So small successes can have tremendous impact. <laughs> um, being a small, very, very small <laughs> company, um, I think our success has really been just the business growth that we've had uh, and just in the fa- past few months, de- definitely the last six months. Um, you know, one, honestly, to be recognized and to be invited to come to something like this. And I looked and I'm like, I think you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> Did you make a mistake? But Vicki, thank you so much. And thanks to the SBDC um, for allowing me to be here and for inviting me. I really do appreciate it. It's an honor. Um, and so, you know, that to me is a huge success for a small company like myself. Um, in addition, just in the last month, we had a new prime contractor that's come to us not once, but twice to um, team up with them on some work. Um, we One proposal we've already forwarded and we're looking at another. And so that was unexpected. They came to us. So to me, I'm like, oh, they're coming to us. I look forward to that day. <laughs> so, um, and that, you know, again, put it in perspective. I mean, that's happened really quick. I mean, if you look at, you know, even three years and with sole, sole proprietor for the first couple of years, first, yeah, two years. Um, and then this year, you know, is really when we, we said, no kidding, this is going to be a company. And so that is a big deal to, to us. Um, and then um, lastly, because of these other efforts, you, know, I heard me, you heard me talk about losing the one contract basically is what's ultimately going to happen because they're not going to be able to continue the funding. Um, but you know what? Other things have presented themselves. We've had other opportunities. And we've actually brought on um, additional uh, part-time employees because we have uh, a lot of irons in the fire and a lot of things that um, we, we are working. So even though we lost that, we've got other opportunities and we're bringing people on. So, so we are growing. So. So those are uh, our blessings. Uh, we count those as uh, uh, successes, and maybe small, but but they're a big deal to us. So. Very good. It's hard to follow all those stories. <laughs> I gotta say, my biggest success is marked by the fact that I was able to kind of let go of that security blanket of being employed and being taken care of and being handed a regular paycheck and um, that that whole kind of environment and where my husband and I just decided we would, you know, launch into this new business, new, uh, whole new um, stage of our lives together and you know it is hard you know we we live and work together and sometimes that's not always a good mix but Tim and I are kind of yin and yang when it comes to that he's he he thinks like the true engineer and I'm the true liberal arts type of thinker lawyer type so really our our blended thoughts and experiences and um, know-hows have worked well it's a good mix Luckily, you know, we haven't gotten to the point where, you know, we, we, we fight or anything like that. Of course, if we do, I win because, you know, <laughs> 50, yeah. 51%. Oh. <laughs> oh. Sorry, Tim, right in front of him. Um, but really, I think that that was the biggest success is going forward is that we can we can make it what we want. And we don't, you know, we don't answer to anybody anymore. You know, we don't have the security, but uh, I think the flip side is, has suited us pretty well. And I'm happy about that. And um, I'm proud to say that we did it. And what we have today is only because of our own efforts and nobody else's. And, uh, and I'm, I'm glad about that. Um, now we have some time for questions. We have a microphone if you would like to use a microphone. If anyone has a question, like we'll start over here. Go ahead. Thank you. I consider being on a board of directors for a nonprofit because I'm sitting here listening to your background, what motivates you, everything that goes around, and each one of you brings something to the table that we need. What's the nonprofit? I envision uh, transportation, transit in any market where you can use a single payment platform on a bus, a light rail, or a taxi cab. But we have to fix the taxi cab business first, and then it moves into the transit. And I've spoken to some transit people around the country, but I want to base it out of Brevard because there's a lot of contributing factors, but number one is a central dispatch, and I can put disabled veterans sitting at home on a computer dispatching taxis in San Diego, California. So there's some jobs here. And 
Plus, it's a legacy thing. My father's, you know, he one of the early guys out of the cave. I mean, he, he was on the church council for St. Teresa's when it was a wooden schoolhouse and they put on the first fair. If that gives you some depth. So, understand there's part of that too. And I, I'm truly concerned about where Titusville is now with the Space Center setting down. I, I have a vision for what I think Titusville can be, having been out in the world. I mean, I, I was in the restaurant business when Disney. Colorado Ski Resorts went out to San Francisco and then back to Colorado and now back here to start putting this together. So I've been around a bit. And uh, yeah, I, I have a vision for Titusville too. But that's why I came back here. And I'm just sitting here listening to you guys. It's like, well, I'm gonna need some kiosks in certain areas for certain reasons. You're doing this metal manufacturing. There's some training programs that I need for the fleets that involve. I mean, involves perfectly what you're looking at here. I mean, I just can't believe it. Law, yeah, I've got some contracts. I need to check. <laughs> Business laws because it's between some certain organizations. The IT, holy guacamole! I need some custom-made <laughs> systems because I'm telling you, I don't want to go to these already existing software people because once I let the cat out of the bag about what I'm dispatching with, the enemies out there that I have are enormous. So there's going to be some risks. I don't want to need to know what coming, and I can do that. And uh, oh, who is this? that's all HR. Organizing these fleets as independent contractors together as an LLC. Oh my God, you wouldn't believe these contracts I had to put together to get them to work as a team instead of a bunch of pirates. <laughs> so, yeah, would you guys consider it? That's all I'm asking. <laughs> well, thank you. Questions? You mentioned, I believe it was a board of advisors. Mm -hmm. But out of the five of you, how many of you have a truly formal board? And how many of you have an informal? I'm just looking for formal versus informal. I, I have informal. Same thing. I always I always push back because a lot of business types would say, "Oh, it's your size. You ought to have a, a board of advisors and that kind of thing." I'm like, you know what? I got a board of advisors. It really, it's a lot of the people. I'm not afraid to ask questions, yeah. but also the negative. I got the people who, when I'm having a bad day, prop me up, mm -hmm. but on the same side, when I want to run something past somebody. So I don't, and I don't think I ever will. Unless I decide, you know, going public or have a, if I have an investor at some point for one of the companies that we've started, I might. But otherwise, informal has suited me quite well. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I, excuse oh. me. I'm starting a formal one just because people know so much more than I do. I need their advice. And when you can't pay people, you put them on your board. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but except, I mean, except you got a lot of times you got to pay the ones. Like, that's right. the reason I don't right. have them on a board. Right. Yeah. These I don't, so they're oh, good okay. ones. But okay. yeah, just because they have much more expertise yeah. than I do. Well, I, my wife and I bought our house in 1999. Um, the next door neighbor, there were two problems. He was a lawyer and he was a Democrat. So I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure we were gonna get along. I wasn't sure we were gonna get along. Uh -oh. they so down there. So. <laughs> End of the day, he would turn out to be one of my best friends ever. Um, and he advised me through the purchase of our business. He was always a great sounding board on legal issues. Um, to to um, Kathy's point, excuse me, uh, a legal, legal counsel. I mean, if he charged me for all, all the time I took of his, I'd probably be broke. Um, but he was a great friend and he was a great counsel. And when you're a small person, small business, you know, I don't think many of them can afford to have a true board of directors but you but you got somewhere you have to have those people that you know you can go sit down and, and uh, have a sandwich with or a cup of coffee or, or a beer and say hey you know what am I gonna do and then you get maybe you have two or three of those even where you can get some different perspectives maybe you can get a Democrat a Republican and an independent or something <laughs> I mean a board of directors just sounds tough. <laughs> so, and that's why I would like them to, you know, a board of advisors or trusted agents, because that's what they are. They're the pick me up. They're the, hey, the reality checked, you know, um, basically, you know, the advisors to whatever we're doing. And, and, and their backgrounds vary um, depending on the subject matter that I need, you know, their expertise on. Um, and sometimes they're just a, you know, you can cry on my shoulder. I know you're having a rough day and that sucks, but so they're there for everything and in between. So trusted agents, definitely, definitely. We don't have any. But I see, in, I see the role as more of strategic advisors, mm -hmm. strategic planners, and maybe somebody bringing that kind of very 50,000 foot level 
uh, perspective into your business. So maybe we'll grow to the point where we'll need some. But right now, it's, you know, I do it old school and I use my network of friends and, mm -hmm. and but it's the same thing. It, it, it's really the same sentiment. I just rely on the people that I've always relied on to, to help me and give me advice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, in the last several years, we've seen several U.S. companies bring their manufacturing operations back to the U.S. Uh, you know, little onesie twosies where it's kind of coming back. How can we, or how can an opera identify some of those companies that really would be targets to bring their manufacturing back, other than the EDC folks, and those of us who'd like to see buildings lit back up in this community and other parts of Bavard County? to really get out of the box and aggressively go after some of the company's management to try to convince them to bring their manufacturing, or at least parts of their manufacturing, back to the United States and located here in Brevard County. Uh, secondly, uh, kind of an adjunct question of that, in terms of manufacturing and production, what do you see missing in this in Brevard County? Y'all are doing your own things, but you're in the, you're part of the club. So what do you see that could be brought in that's, that's not here that if someone has the resource connections to, to go out and reach out and bring those people in and kind of give us a full suite of manufacturers or products here in Brevard County? Nancy, I know you're going to yeah. say something, so I'm not going to let you go. I think, first of all, we, I work with an organization called the Society of Manufacturing Engineers, and they're all over and we have a branch in Brevard and we're trying to educate companies in all this export that was sent overseas can come back, reshoring. We d actually have the problem, Jay, that there aren't a lot of companies left to do this. So again, it leads to our teaming. What are we missing? It's again, the young people that want to go into the fields of manufacturing. And that's also an, a real, um, hot point with this group. So I think it's coming. I actually have, for anyone that wants it, a manufacturer, I have free software that if you've lost a job to China, Mexico, wherever, that this software can make you competitive by showing this to your customer and saying, if you take into account quality, freight time, all of these things that we can do it equally as well and cheaply, as if you send it overseas. And there is a huge shift to this from the quality perspective. But quite frankly, what we're missing is we had lots of great companies in Brevard. I now look around and a lot of those great companies are gone. That may be attrition, that may be so many things, financial. So I think keeping your eyes and ears open, there's a lot of this coming back, you know, opportunities that might come to bring this and being open for it. I'm trying to bring my manufacturing back to Brevard. I mean, I'm over in Orange County. I always said this when I was in Brevard. If I was in the entertainment business, Orange County's wonderful. <laughs> if I'm in the manufacturing and technical business, I think Brevard is. So I think keeping those doors open and talking to people is a very important. But don't discount the manpower is missing. We thought we had all these displaced workers. A lot of them aren't here. I work all the time with Brevard workforce to make sure we still have a good workforce. I've gone with my, what I'm doing overseas, I've gone to the universities and said, at least start teaching these classes for young people to get excited. We need to get that whole base, and I don't know how exactly to do that, but I mean, that's. And I agree with that. I think it's the workforce. It's, mm -hmm. you know, the, is anyone familiar with the BMAP program at BCC? That's the apprenticeship for the Brevard Machinist Apprenticeship, whatever program. We've got a couple guys that are in it. That thing's in danger of going away. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, it's almost a nonprofit for, for BCC. It's almost a, a negative. Um, but, but, but so it's those kinds of things. I think it's the uh, getting the right uh, programs, the training, the focus. That's the problem. You know, a lot of people, we ask these questions, but, you know, it's, it's hard to really formulate, okay, what are we going to do? Let's actually do something about it. So I also think the first step is a culture, and I know you've probably heard this before, that everyone thinks that those kinds of jobs in manufacturing are low-end jobs and low skills, and even your young kids coming up think that. You know, they're still thinking lawyers and doctors and whatever, and it's not the case, that it's quite lucrative. And I, So I think we've got to start with the, the mindset, the culture, and the stigma that goes along with those kind of jobs. And then we got to have the programs. And sure, the, the SMEs, the MEPs, Brevard Workforce, man, they are all doing everything they can. Uh, but but if we got to do more. we got to actually have some actions and stop talking about it. And until we get that workforce here, 
what, what are we trying to, we're going to convince manufacturing companies to come in, yet they got to bring their own people, and then when they want to, when they have to, you know, retention type of things, or they recruit, they're recruiting outside. So I think that's where it starts. And we're actually moving into manufacturing. We signed a Space Act agreement to take over a lot of the equipment that was used for the shuttle, and we've got 160,000 square foot building we just signed a lease on. And so we're really moving more aggressively into the manufacturing. And that is one of the areas that we're struggling is, is the, uh, the workforce. Now, we're putting a lot of time and effort into retraining, uh, you know, a lot of the USA mm -hmm. folks and, uh, and the, you know, aerospace, displaced aerospace workers, that kind of thing. But that isn't totally a solution because those guys are still going to go and retire, and who's coming in behind to help us? And so it's, it's focusing on, on, the, on the culture, I think, and working with the educational institutions to make sure we've got those programs in and place. And I think that's starting at middle school or earlier, yep. talking to these kids and saying this is an honorable position. I spoke at a middle school once, and one of the kids raised their hand, of course said, ma'am, if you were to live your life all over again, what would you be? And I said, maybe a plumber, maybe a, you know, I named these things and they went, why? And I said, because I'd make real money then. <laughs> and I think you have to start talking about these yeah. positions as yeah. positions of honor. And when we come to trying to do internships and mentoring, you know, you'll ask kids. I had a, a girl say to me, my mother said, I'm not allowed to go into that business. I said, give me your mother's phone number. <laughs> and I think we have to collectively speak to people. And I speak at a middle school level to say, you know, I don't know what your direction is. God bless you, become an attorney or you become a doctor. That's great. But not everybody's going to do that. And let's look at what else there is that will also be. But we don't look at it collectively as a country as that being as honorable as we used to. That's 100% that's, that's correct, Jay. I think some, and I heard, I was a sports official in high schools here for 25 years or so. I had a high school principal tell me they were going to get rid of all their athletic programs because they just really wanted to focus on education. <laughs> I wanted to hit her between the eyes <laughs> because that's the worst thing you can do for a kid is take away their physical release, whatever it may be. You know, they have to have sports. They have to have another release. So we have taken what we grew up, I grew up with. Again, I grew up in construction as an electrician with my dad. I learned plumbing. I learned to do all those kinds of things. And a, a kid needs to have a release. You only get self-confidence by accomplishing something. So we have to change the culture of our society that says, you don't need to go to college. You know, learn to be a or plumber. Or you may not need to, right? You know what? At 35, you may, you know, I'm tired of being, working for this guy as a plumber. I'm going to start my own business. That's what we have done. So in, in my business, in the sheet metal and the, and the machining business, you know, every kid thinks they want to be a machinist where you push a button and you put your feet up and you watch the thing run. There's a lot more to it than that. You know, I have to bend metal. Some of the things we do, you know, I guess in some areas could be considered hazardous. We have to change the culture. Right. You know, it's okay to work with your hands. It's okay to get dirty. It's okay to be sweaty and tired at the end of the day because you've accomplished something and you have, you have value and you have self-worth as a society. And I, I mean, think we should start that by making every kid in high school at least work six months in the hospitality industry before he moves on to <laughs> <laughs> Are you in the hospitality industry? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, just took a shot. 20 years. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> With that perspective, you can be successful at anything but, you want. But even to take that to another step, we do some work for FIT, some of their students off and on, which that's another great resource in our county. Mm -hmm. We haven't talked about that. But, um, Long story short, my, my wife had uh, lunch with uh, Dr. Cantonese and, and a couple other people, and she mentioned to him again, because I'd mentioned it before, anybody thought about having a, an intern program with a machine shop or a manufacturing business where these kids that are studying to be engineers can design anything in the world, but you can't make it? And they don't understand that. They don't understand it. And it's, it's not their fault because they're not being taught properly. But things like, like engineers, you know, doctors have an intern program, don't they? Attorneys have an intern program. How come our engineers and other professions don't have an intern program that's required for them to go into the workplace? So I really, really think even things like business majors become an intern somewhere. How come we don't do more of that? So it's a societal issue in, in a way, Jay. I mean, I'm not sure we can, like, put a finger on it and say that'll fix it. But somewhere we have to change our thinking to make that work. So we need to start. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean, it does, and, and, it's, it. and as early as middle school, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Right, even if not earlier in elementary school. Mm -hmm. 
on that note, though, are you are you talking with BCC at all, saying you know because back ten years ago their their hands-on jobs were their tools were great. I was in the welding program here at BCC. We had a full class. And they I don't. Cut it out. I think it's gone. I think I think it disappeared because of funding. Right. Well, I, right. I understand that they, yeah. what they allocated the funding to was the computer sciences, which is great. But I fought with BCC as a student along with my instructor, saying, look. That, if everybody can run a computer, that's wonderful. Everyone can design, as you said, the, the building that they're going to, but nobody can actually build the building that they're designing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it has to start, and, and BCC wanted no part. Nope, this is our decision, that's it. And this is, he was the instructor at the Welling Department. Um, so it, as business owners that are in that field, have you talked with the local, um, the, the colleges, say BCC, but also UCF and other trade schools that can get this back into it? Because I think there's a lot of kids who still, feel that's an honorable job. I don't think that's necessarily gone to Where do I go to get it? And if, if a young kid is in MIMS and the only place he can go, I think the machine shop is now in, the machine class is in Palm Bay, if I'm not mistaken, at BCC. Oh, I, I mean, that's... Yeah, yeah I'm not yeah. sure if it is. Or not. We actually have. We've had the conversations. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on boards at UCF, FIT, and then we, we were working with BCC through the uh, industry council. So we've done that. We've done the industry side where we've had engineers from UCF and FIT come in and work in our shop. But, but, but you know, what I think what Don is saying, okay, well, you also need that backing from, and to make it a mandatory, that's the difference. I mean, because FIT has a great, Donna Gaynor right. runs the uh, intern program. It's great. I mean, but it, awesome. it isn't necessarily a mandatory type of a, um, an offering or whatever you want to call it, requirement. So that that's probably where we need to take it that next I'm step. I'm willing to pay them. It's not like I want free labor. Right. Absolutely. It has nothing Absolutely. to do with money. Right. It's right. like I, I'm willing to pay them a reasonable yeah. wage, salary, right. whatever you want to do. But I think people, you know, it, it's a yeah. working with your hands is a noble thing to do. Yeah. So it's what whatever country shop was. And if I can and add, let's take one last question. If I can add, add to that, that, I think we've got to go down further. And somebody mentioned lower than middle school. Okay. We have a culture in this country, unfortunately, that makes me very disturbed by what I see. We have a culture of entitlement. They're watching, and I'm talking public school kids, are watching their family members sitting on welfare and food stamps. They no longer even have a culture of, I need to work. It's a good thing to work. It's an honorable thing to work. They're watching and they're following in the footsteps of some of their family members that they see they got plenty of time on their hands. They can go and they can go party, they can go have fun, they can do this, and the government is paying me. We have got to turn that around and reach down into the elementary school level and totally change the entitlement mentality that I don't need to work. And that's where we're going to get our future workforce from, is explaining to these children, that's not how you get ahead in life. That is not the way that you need to live your life. And there's two sides to that, I'm going to say, because I worry about my children being spoiled because I'm very blessed. And so the entitlement can be on the other side, too, where they get so much. So we've really worked hard to, you know, my daughter talks about coming to work for Craig Technology. She can't figure out what she could do engineering and technology. She thinks it's engineering technology. I say, oh, no, there's a lot of other things you can file. You can, But it's important on the other side, too, to say, you know, you want to earn, you want to, you know, own something and actually do so I think it's really over both sides you know all the way around is you know get rid of that entitlement and teach us all to work again so. well I think STEM if I even get started on yeah. STEM nobody yeah. will leave yeah. we don't look at those science technology yeah. engineering math and then yeah, we put manufacturing on <laughs> I think if we don't look at that as a country we're in deep trouble and I never thought and I'd see it in my lifetime and I think that's just snowballing and for all of us whether we're in the government whether we're in business, whatever, those are scary, scary things. But we want to end on a happy note. I would like to express gratitude to our panelists, to um, Nancy, Don, Carol, Karen, and Kathy. So please join me in showing gratitude to everyone here. As, as well as thank you to the SBDC.